bigger car, but a smaller turbocharged engine. Smaller car, but with a bigger engine that has no turbo, but a sophisticated variable valve timing system and a higher compression ratio. This one produces more torque, but this one produces more power. Zero to 62 miles per hour, 8.1 seconds, 6.5. But which one uses less fuel? I'm going to test the fuel economy of both cars on urban roads with speed limits up to 40 miles per hour, on a dual carriageway with a speed limit up to 70 miles per hour, and on rural roads with a mix of 30, 40, 50, and 60 mile per hour speed limits. It's cold this morning and both are going to have a cold start. So when I press that button and turn this engine on, that's it, I can't retake this because I only get one shot at a cold start. And in this car, and there's that shot, I must go now, I must continue, I can't retake this. Uh, four degrees outside, but this car got to wait 10 seconds before I move according to the owner's manual. And I am gonna follow that because that is the guidance. So I think actually that is fair. I know when the 10 seconds are up because the engine changes its sound. There it is, it's done. So I can get going now. Uh, I've turned stop start off just out of habit. I always do that. I don't use the stop start in this car. So I'm gonna be testing it without that. The reason why I'm not using stop start is because it's quite unrefined in this vehicle. And as a result, I don't generally use it. So I think it's only fair that I do the test without using it. Also, in the Leon, I won't be using stop start. And that's because in that car, not only is it unrefined, but it doesn't work. Yes, it turns the engine off and turns it back on again when I press the clutch down. But if I don't wait, one to two seconds after the engine starts before moving away it stalls quite often it doesn't seem to have any power the moment the engine switches on it seems to take a second or two for power to be there so i'll start to move away i think oh yes i'm going and then clunk engine power dies and the engine turns off and i know i'm not the only one who experiences that problem with that particular car so in that car one of the first things i do is turn that stop start button or switch the stop start system off. I will be listening to the gear shift indicator on both cars, not for acceleration. If I'm speeding up and going around this roundabout like now, of course, I'm not looking at that. But if I'm cruising at a steady speed, I will take its advice. Usually at 30 miles an hour, this car wants me in sixth gear. At the moment, it's been asking only for fifth gear. So you'll ask now, there you go, asking me for fifth instead of sixth, probably because it's a cold start and it wants that lower gear whilst it warms up. Yes, sixth is very high for 30 miles an hour, but all cars are different. And this car asks for sixth and it seems to work fine. It doesn't struggle and it even goes up moderate hills. Just because your revs are low, that doesn't mean you're using less fuel because there's two things to consider. One is revs, engine speed, but the other is vehicle load or engine load. The best way I can describe load is to imagine using a rowing machine on its lowest setting. You can go really fast, but then someone comes along and puts it on its highest setting. Suddenly, oh, that's a lot harder and you've got to go a lot slower. And that's like going up a gear in a car. When you go up a gear, that reduces your revs, but it's much harder for the engine to now turn the wheels, which is why going up a gear doesn't necessarily save you fuel. It may, but if the gear is too high for the situation, you'll actually use more fuel. And that's why many cars now have gear shift indicators to tell you what the optimum gear is for your current speed and the hill that you're on and how hard you're trying to accelerate. The coolant has some heat in it now. It's off the blue marker here. So the heater's working and it's actually blowing some nice warm air into my hands. That does feel good. Even though it is a cold day and there was some ice outside of my car, as you can see before I got in, it is a sunny day. It's quite a nice day, but it does make filming hard because you get a lot of shadows and when you're going past trees, you get flickering. So I'll try my best to choose the camera that has the best image for that particular moment in time when I'm talking. I've had this car just over three years now and just over 25,000 miles. 
yes, I still enjoy it. Whether I'm driving it around town like I am now, driving at normal speeds or taking it on a track day, I just like getting in it. Even just getting in it, putting my seatbelt on, I feel like I'm in something special. It's probably the seating position, but I think it's also when you drive it, how it turns when you turn the wheel. It doesn't have the most amount of steering feel. And if you come from something like a Vauxhall VX220 or a Lotus Elise, yeah, they have a lot more steering feel. It's hard to explain why the car is so enjoyable. It's not like you can go, oh, it does naught to 60 in this time, or it's got this top speed, or it goes round the Nürburgring in this time, that's why it's good. You can't sum it up like that. But it just brings a little bit of delight to my day when I drive it. And even if I'm driving it slowly like I am now, I enjoy it. For both cars, I'm not going to drive them in a particularly economical way. Yes, I'm going to drive them sensibly, which is going to be fairly economical, but I'm not going to try and do special eco driving tips and try to avoid the brakes as much as possible. I'm just going to drive normally, accelerate and slow down with the flow of traffic and change gear the way I'd normally do and take the gear shift indicator's advice if I am cruising like I am now. It told me sixth gear is the best gear, so I've put it into sixth and that's probably gonna be giving me the best economy for the speed, which at the moment, the constant economy says 73 miles per gallon. And the average at the moment is 37.2, which is pretty good. I've got the climate control set to 21 degrees Celsius with the air conditioning on, and I'll do the same in the Leon. If you're wondering why I have the air conditioning on, even though it's three degrees Celsius outside, and that's because in these cars, I leave the air conditioning on permanently. That does not mean the air conditioning compressor is running, it's automatic. It will only switch itself on and off as it needs to. And as it's so cold outside, it's not going to be switching itself on much. But it's good to leave it on. I like to use the auto system so that it can cycle the compressor every so often, just a little bit, just to keep it working so that come the summer months, it hasn't seized up. Also, if it does start to rain, it can help reduce the mist that appears on the windows. Keeps the windows clear, gives me good visibility. The reason why you should allow this car to run for 10 seconds after a cold start before you actually drive it is because it has a long exhaust manifold and therefore the catalytic converter is further from the engine. So the engine has to try harder to heat up the catalytic converter and it does that by delaying the spark which puts more heat into the exhaust. The trouble is when it's doing that the gas pedal becomes like an on-off trigger. It's very hard to manage so it's hard to drive. You can drive it but it's not nice. If you wait 10 seconds until the tone of the engine changes then it becomes normal to drive again. The owner's manual says I should wait 10 seconds and that is why I waited 10 seconds, although it does say that you're not allowed to do that in Germany. Many cars these days need a petrol particulate filter to pass emission standards and go on sale, but this car doesn't have one. And that's because it's clean enough without one. And that says a lot about this two litre Skyactiv G engine. It runs clean enough that it doesn't need that extra filter in the exhaust that many cars these days have. 8.2 miles in, so 8.3, it's about halfway through this journey now, and it's 42.7 miles per gallon, despite the cold start. I'm very impressed with that. Okay, so coming up to the end of the urban drive now, saying 15 miles and 44.8 miles per gallon. So I'm gonna pull over first and then record and write down the fuel economy after I've actually stopped. I'll try and stop in the same place in the Leon or as close to the same place as possible. Very close to the dual carriageway now. That's the advantage of coming here is I can jump straight on the 70 mile an hour road. Okay, so that's parked. And it says 44.8 miles per gallon, 15.1 miles. Well, I've done these economy tests before, 
and my urban route was 16 miles. So I must have done a slightly different route this time. I couldn't remember the exact route that I did. It's been a while since I've done one, so I've obviously changed it a bit. But I'm gonna do the same route for the lounge, so it is gonna be a comparison between these two cars over the exact same route. So trip computer has been reset again, and I'm heading towards the 70 mile per hour road. It's 30 at the moment. When I get to the national speed limit sign, I'll be able to accelerate. Not up to 70 looking at the traffic. Whatever speed I do on this run though, I'm gonna try and keep it the same in the layout. So if I can't do 70 much, I won't do 70 much in the layout. At the moment, I'm doing 50 miles an hour, matching the speed of the traffic in the major road and merging. Maybe it's just a busy pocket because it's coming out of a 50 zone there because there's road works behind me and hopefully it will clear up soon. But either way, I'm gonna try and keep the speed about the same in both cars. Move to lane two now. That's 60. Yeah, I think I should be able to do 70 soon when it clears up a bit. I've been very lucky so far. I've done 15.9 miles and most of that has been at 70 miles per hour. At the start of the dual carriageway, I was stuck doing 50, 60 for about a minute or two but then it cleared up i had the cruise control and at 70 miles an hour and i was able to stick to that most of the way not done yet though but so far 48.3 miles per gallon the reason why i'm using the trip computer instead of the fill tank method is because in my experience when you're only covering around about 20 miles the fill tank method is highly inaccurate. And that's because you're only using about two liters of fuel. So if your pump clicks off half a liter earlier or half a liter later than the last time you filled up, which they do, they're not always the same, that completely ruins the result. You're talking a half a liter discrepancy out of two liters that's a big difference the trip computer is more reliable in this situation where i'm doing short distances if you're using 45 liters that half a liter difference makes a small difference and you get quite an accurate reading but i've owned this car for three years and my lay on for 10 years and i've done the fill tank method in both many times in fact in the Leon, I've done it over 600 times, I think 650 times, and I have a very good idea of how accurate the trip computer is. In this car, it tends to tell me I've got about one mile per gallon better than I actually have. And I'll make a note of that later when I do the results. But in the Leon, that's more interesting. For the first 100,000 miles, it used to tell me I got two or three more miles per gallon than I actually did. By 100,000 miles, it was accurate. What it said I got, I got. And now the car has over 200,000 miles on the clock, it's a bit pessimistic. It tells me I've got 35 miles per gallon, but actually when I work it out, I've got closer to 38. It seems to underread was that underread yeah underread by two to three miles per gallon so when i do the results i'll tell you what the trip computer says but also i'll tell you what i think it actually did based on my experience i've returned to lane one now because i'm about to leave that was a really good run on the 70 mile an hour road i managed to stay at 70 with the cruise control on for a long time 49.4 miles per gallon so far now let's try not to miss my exit because I haven't got it on the sat nav, but I know it's here somewhere and it is a small one. I can see the white sign now. It's not much of a slow down lane here. So you do have to slow down a bit before you leave the road and then do the rest in the slow down lane and people often crash into this wall. That's in front of me there. So I have a place where I take the measurement. I'll get there, I'll stop. And when I stop, that is the reading I'm gonna use. So I usually pull up just on the right here, because usually there's another car on the right and a part behind it, but there's not one today. And what does it say? 23.2 miles and 49.9 miles per gallon. 
Now it's time for the country roads. There's been an accident and the road is blocked, so I'm not able to do my normal country route. But it doesn't matter, I can find an alternative route. I found one here. I'm gonna reset the trip computer now, and I'll do the same route in both cars. So it should be fine. Just a different route to normal. And the sat-nav says it's gonna be 13 miles. The route that the sat-nav found around the car accident included a lot of 30 mile an hour roads. So I've modified it slightly. I'm gonna do the same route in both cars, so it doesn't matter that it is different, but it's gonna be longer than I said it was, just because I want more 60 roads. And the, the route that the sat-nav found included a lot of 30 roads. It was closer to an urban drive than a rural route drive. So this one's gonna be more accurate in terms of staying closer to 60 more of the time, which is what I'm doing now, about 58 miles an hour. There's gonna be some 30s in it. I've just gone through a 50 mile an hour section as well, but a lot of this now is 60 miles an hour all the way back. I'm not revving the engine hard. I'm changing up at about two to 3,000 RPM, but I am making the most out of the speed limit when it's safe to do so. I really don't know which car is gonna be more economical because they both seem to be about the same to me. Although I think this one may be two or three miles per gallon better. On all of them actually, in urban driving at 70 miles an hour and on the country roads. This always seems to be just that little bit more economical than that 1.4 litre turbo. It is a different car though. So that does make a difference as well. This weighs a bit less and it's smaller, so it doesn't take so much energy to push it through the air. Okay, so that's the end of the country route. 15.6 miles, currently displaying 46.1 miles per gallon. I'll park up and when I've parked up, that will be the end result. I had to drive a little bit slower than I would usually drive on these roads. And that's because the conditions today aren't great. Some bits were dry and I was able to make full progress and do 60 miles per hour, but the wet bits and the slipperier bits, some bits were a bit icy, I had to go a little bit slower. And unfortunately, it's not the same route um, as usual. So you won't be able to compare this to other videos I've done with different cars because I couldn't do the same route simply because of that accident. So, finished. 45.9 miles per gallon, 15.6 miles. Now I need to do the same test in the Leon and do it quick before the kids get out of the schools and block the roads up. I just watched back the footage of the cold start on the Mazda and it actually took closer to 20 seconds before I could start driving it, before the engine changes its tone and the gas pedal becomes manageable. Before that point, the gas pedal is it's like an on-off switch. You press it a little bit, the revs go vroom, they fly up. The owner's manual says 10 seconds, but it is a particularly cold day today, so it's probably why it took longer. And I was thinking, should I do the same thing in the Leon? And I was like, no, I shouldn't. This car doesn't require that, so why should this car have that disadvantage? But the trouble is, I made a mistake. And that mistake was, I forgot to reset the trip computer on the Mazda before the cold start. I reset it at the end of the car park. So it had about 30 seconds of running before I actually reset that trip computer. So it wasn't a true cold start. I want the test to be as fair as possible comparing the same drive. So I will do the same thing in this Leon. I'll start it, run it for 20 seconds, drive to the end of the car park, then I will reset the trip computer. It's not as good of a test as I would have liked it because I would like to see the difference between the cold start on the Mazda compared to this, but at least for the majority of the drive, it's going to be more fair. So let's make sure my seat's in a good position and I'll get my stopwatch up. I'll start it. Where are we now? There it is. Start, 20 seconds I'll start moving. I'll get to the end of the car park, I'll reset the trip computer and the test starts there. I have taken my learner hat off, that's the, the roof box with the L plates, because that does make a difference to fuel economy. I'm not sure how much, I would guess five miles to the gallon at motorway speeds and not much at urban speeds. 
maybe that's an idea for a video. Also, I will be following the gear shift indicator on this car as well. I figured out why the urban route was one mile shorter than it usually is for the other tests I've done. And it's because I missed out a little loop around town. I didn't go down uh, St. Bottles, I believe it's called. So that missed off about a mile. Doesn't matter though, I'm gonna do the exact same route in this car. It just means that you can't use this video to compare uh, this car with other cars and other videos, which is a bit annoying. I'd rather all the routes be the same across the videos, but that's hard to do. And with the car collision on the country road, well, that Range Rover's getting close. With the car collision on the country road, it meant I wouldn't have been able to do that route anyway. So that one was out of my hands, whereas the urban route, that was my error. These two cars are very different. The MX-5 is designed for fun. This car is designed to be comfortable and practical. Maybe a little bit of fun in there as well. When I'm driving the MX-5, I don't feel uncomfortable. I'm quite happy. But when I step out of that and get into this, like I just have done back to back, I realize how much more comfortable this seat is, this driving position is, how much smoother the suspension is, and how much easier it is to change gear smoothly. Whereas, when I get out of this car and back into the MX-5, I'm not thinking about comfort, I just realize how much more fun that one is to drive. This is where on the other videos where I've done the urban route, I would turn right at these traffic lights and go around town a bit. But as I didn't when I was driving the Mazda, I'm not going to with this car. Coming to the end of the urban drive now, traffic's been similar, maybe a little bit worse in the Leon. So far it's saying 40.2 miles per gallon, which I think is worse than the Mazda, although I can't quite remember, so I have to check when I stop. I'll try and stop in the same place, which was near this shop. There is a space for me there, so I'll stop just after this white van. I reversed in the Mazda as well when I pulled over. That is exactly the same place, I think. Aha. Well, I wanted to reverse, but a car has pulled in behind me. So I think what I'll do is I'll go forwards up behind this car and just park in the next space. There we go. So what have we got then? 40.1 miles per gallon. I don't know what the Mazda was actually. I think it was just over 40. Let's have a look. Write down, ooh, 44.8 in the Mazda. So I'll write this one down and I'll get to the 70 mile an hour roads. Where this car is better than the MX-5 is on these roads, on fast roads, because it's so much quieter in here. And the sporty character of the MX-5 doesn't shine on a dual carriageway. Also, because this engine has a lot more torque, if I'm in top gear, and floor the throttle, say at 50 or 60 miles an hour, it accelerates to 70, like now for example, there you go, to 70 quite quickly, much more quickly than the MX-5 does. I haven't timed it, but it certainly feels more quick. I've been quite lucky actually, because on the dual carriage race today, I've managed to stay at 70 miles an hour most of the time on both trips. I'm not finished yet, but I haven't got long to do. I've been going between Colchester and Chelmsford and then back to Colchester again. I turn around at the roundabout, Boreham interchange in Chelmsford. But yes, yeah, so I've been able to do 70 miles an hour on the cruise control most of the time. I haven't had many elephant races. I think the one I was just stuck behind just then was the first elephant race I've been stuck behind. Coming to the end of the dual carriageway section now. I don't actually go all the way back to Colchester. I come off here at Silver End and then do some country road driving. So still at 70 miles an hour. So far 44.5 miles per gallon. Can't remember what the MX-5 was. I think it was similar. So I'm starting to slow down. Signaling now to leave here. Short slip road. It's down to about 50 on the main road here and then finish off the slowing down in the slow down lane. Okay, I'll get parked up. 
and we'll see what the result is. I think it is similar, but bear in mind the economy on this car, the trip computer under reads. So although it says 45, that would usually mean it's got 47, but I'll get, that, I'll get to that later. At the end of the video, I'll do that. I'll compare what the trip computer says compared to what I think it's actually got. So, 45 miles to the gallon. So this is the same country road as last time in the same spot. Reset the trip computer. There we go. And let's get going. In the MX-5, I left the climate control on auto with the air conditioning on and it's set to 21 degrees Celsius. I'm doing the same thing in this car, but I have it set to 20 degrees Celsius. And that's not because I want it to be cooler. That's because I find 20 in this car is about the equivalent to 21, 22 in the Mazda. They're not all the same climate control systems. If you ask for 20, it doesn't mean you actually get 20, you get somewhere near 20. In fact, in the Corolla, I usually end up having that on 22 and a half or 23 to feel the same way as I do in this car. Maybe that's an idea for a video. Maybe I should compare how uh, warm or what temperature you actually get from climate control systems when you ask for a set temperature. I'm sure they're all different. I reckon they're within two to three degrees of each other. Probably not many people will be interested in that. That is very geeky, but I'll be honest, I'd be interested. This is where I miss the Mazda MX-5. When the road gets a bit windy and you have to speed up and slow down often. That's where the suspension and the snickety gear shift of the MX-5 starts to really make sense. It's not bad in this car, in the same way that the MX-5 is not bad on the motorway and it's not bad around town, but it's not really great either. Now, this car isn't great on these roads, but the MX-5 is. Although I am in a 30 at the moment. This is a very short 30 through Great Wigborough. And where am I at the moment? 40.9 miles per gallon. We'll see how that compares when we're finished back into the national speed limit zone. I'm driving very calmly and sedately. I'm not revving the engine too much. The same as what I was doing in the MX-5. But even though in that car I was driving it in the same way I was driving this one, not revving the engine, and really exploiting the chassis. It's still more fun in that car, even at this speed. This is where I've got to start to be a little bit careful. When the road gets shaded, it can be a little bit damp, two and a half degrees, so it is possible it could be a bit icy. So on bits of road like this, I am taking it easy. It's much easier to just stay in a high gear in this car though. There's no real need to change down from sixth most of the time because there's so much torque that when you put your foot on the gas it just goes up to that speed regardless of whether or not I change down a gear. So finishing up the country drive now, 40.5 miles per gallon. Don't remember what that was in the MX-5 but you'll find out very soon. I'll take the reading when I finish parking just to make it fair, I mean, I park over there in the MX-5, I park here, it's a couple of car lengths away, not gonna make any difference. Although if I got it in first time, it would. So I did have to make an adjustment with the last one because it's kind of impossible to park the MX-5, but this one I usually get in first time, just messed it up a little bit. Yeah, where I park the MX-5, you gotta reverse twice to make it round that wall. Now with this one, there was no excuse. Anyway, end result, 40.3 miles per gallon. Now I'm gonna round up the figures. I'm very pleased with the runs. I managed to keep them similar. On the 70 mile an hour roads, I was able to maintain 70 most of the time. Through the urban roads, the Leon did get a bit more traffic but not much difference. And on the country road that I eventually got to do because I had to change my plans due to an accident, again, there wasn't much traffic. I was able 
to do the speed I wanted to do, which was a bit slower than usual because of the conditions. You can see ice in some places at the side of the road still, because it has been cold all day. I'm filming this on the 16th of January, and that, if you remember, was a particularly cold one. So, figures, here we go. Claimed figures first, and then I'll put the adjusted figures up on screen afterwards. MX-5 Urban, that was 44.8, but the Leon on the Urban Roads was 40.1. 70 miles an hour, MX-5, 49.9. The Leon on the 70 mile an hour roads was 45. On the country roads, the MX-5 was 45.9 but the Leon was 40.3, so quite a difference there. The MX-5 is claiming to be much more economical than this car, but the trip computer on the MX-5 is actually quite accurate, it's usually very close. It does overread a little bit, but not by much. It's this car that's the problem, this underreads. So I'm gonna adjust the figures now. I'm going to take one mile per gallon off of the MX-5 figures and add two miles per gallon to the Leon, which I think I probably could add a bit more for the Leon, but I'm gonna leave at two. Sometimes it is a bit less than two, sometimes it's a bit more, sometimes it's even three, but I think two is probably about right. So that's a, a closing, I'm closing the gap by three miles per gallon here by taking one off of the MX-5 and adding two to the Leon. Yet still, the MX-5 is a bit more economical. So, urban roads, MX-5 43.8, Leon 42.1. Um, 70 mile an hour roads, MX-5 48.9, Leon 47. And on the country roads, MX-5 44.9, Leon 42.3. So, the MX-5 was more economical on all of those roads. I haven't found the economy of this car get any worse in the 10 years, or it'd be 10 years in a couple of weeks. I've got this on the 1st of February, 2014. It's now the 16th of January, 2024. I haven't found that real world fuel economy has got any worse. It seems to be about the same. What's changed is the trip computer. And I have tested it, as I said earlier, many times, over 600 times. I have a Fuelly account, which is like this online website where you put in how many liters and how many miles you've done and it works out your actual fuel economy and i've done that religiously every time since i've owned this car for this car i haven't done it for the mx5 i can't go that far and do it for multiple vehicles but i've done it for this car and i still do it now i don't remember what i'm up to i think it might be 650 fill ups but i'm very used to what i actually get from that test filling up the tank checking the miles of fuel tank method compared to the trip computer. I think one of the reasons why the MX-5 is more efficient though is because it's a bit lighter. Uh, I can't remember the weight exactly. From memory, this is 1,211 kilos. I'm pretty sure of that actually. And the MX-5 I think is 1,050, but I'm not 100% sure on that. I'll put it on screen, the Leon and the MX-5. But the other difference as well is that the MX-5 is smaller. I don't know the drag coefficient, which is the shape of the car, how good it is at going through the air based on its shape, but I can see with my own eyes that the Leon is a bigger vehicle. It takes up more room, therefore it has a bigger frontal area that it's trying to get through the air, and that will make a difference. So that's gonna be against uh, the Leon here and a plus for the MX-5. So which engine is more efficient? don't think there's much in it. I think they're basically the same. I'd be interested to see both these vehicles on exactly the same, uh, sorry, both these engines on exactly the same vehicle and a scientific test, because I think they're, they're very similar. One gives you a sporting drive, the other gives you low down torque and ease of use. Well, I hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're looking for car insurance, check out the links to Collingwood and Confused in the description. If you're learning to drive and want to insure yourself on somebody else's car, then Collingwood are there for you because you can do so without affecting the owner's policy. And that takes away a big stress from the owner of that car. Via the link at the moment, there's up to 35% off and a 20 pound Amazon gift card. 
If you want to insure your own car, I recommend checking out the link to confuse.com because you fill out one quote form and get loads of quotes back from many insurers to compare who's cheapest. And you can change your car on that quote as many times as you like without having to do the whole form again, which means it's a quick and easy way to compare how much it costs to insure different cars. Using the links doesn't cost you anything, but it does support the channel, so thank you very much. Subscribe to get my future videos, and until the next one, cheerio.